Uh, so in this paper, we're interested in international relations. Uh, so this is the subfield of political science uh, that studies the way countries interact with each other. And at a very high level, what we're doing in this paper is we take a bunch of data of countries interacting and we learn uh, latent structure that connects these different interactions, okay? The structures that we're gonna, we call multilateral relations. Okay, so, uh, I just use the arrow keys. Thank you. Yeah, please. Thank you. Fine. Is this still? Okay. Cool. So uh, international relations are multilateral. What we what we mean by that is that. Uh, the behavior of individual countries uh, or the relationships between pairs of countries is highly dependent on the, the network of countries that they're embedded in. Okay, so this is, uh, this is literally a toy example. Uh, so the decision of the blue player to attack the gray player um, it might be very dependent on whether green attacks red, right? And so if we were studying the relationship between uh, blue and green over the course of the game, which is something that political science scientists do, right? They might study U.S.-Russian relations over the course of the 1980s or something like that. So if we were studying this bilateral relation between uh, blue and gray, we would not be able to understand it without taking into context the actions of green or the relationship between green and red, right? So this is the idea of multilateralism. And so for, for many years, political scientists have been collecting and analyzing data that looks like this. These are called dyadic events, dyadic meaning pairwise. Okay, and so an event here, a row here, um, is characterized by a time step. This is when the event happened. Um, a, a sender country or a source country, this is a country that is doing something to another country. Okay, a receiver country or a target, this is the country that's having something done to them, and an action type. And the action type, typically these are from some kind of ontology. Um, in this case, it's the Weiss ontology. What's important is that these actions are coming from some set of um, you know, low-dimensional action types, okay? And so for a given event, say this one, um, this is Iraq uh, to Kuwait doing some kind of mobilization. Okay, where does this come from? This is extracted from the news. And this particular one um, was extracted from this particular headline, uh, July 31st, Iraq increases troop levels on Kuwait border. Okay, so in this case, some human, some political scientist with some annotation scheme read this, saw, okay, Iraq is the country that is doing something, uh, increases troop levels on border. This is an action that is pretty much a mobilization action, right? And if you mobilize on someone's border, in this case Kuwait, they're, they're the receiving country. And so they, they annotated the sentence, they extracted this event, and went into this, this set. Okay, so traditionally, um, when you have human annotators doing this, uh, the, the data sets they created, uh, you know, several years ago, were sort of small, high, but highly curated, and very specific to certain regions or certain uh, types of actions. Okay, and, so, and, and, and small enough that a political scientist could take, for example, this set of events, sift through the data set, and come up with this set of events, which have some sort of coherent thread, right? And they've labeled it the Iraq-Kuwait crisis. And all of these actions, all of these events are part of some meaningful story. Okay, so nowadays, um, people are starting to use information extraction, natural language processing techniques, and they're starting to do this event extraction at scale from millions of documents, many different languages, and you go from something that's nice and curated to, to a mess, to this, right? Huge data. And it's the typical thing with big data. It's very exciting, but it's very noisy, okay? And so this, uh, this particular uh, image was taken from GDELT. This is a very large event data set. Uh, they have over a quarter billion events, uh, and they extract every day. They're updating. They automatically extract from um, RSS feeds, from news, and they're, they're constantly populating this database. And so there's tons of uh, dyadic events, uh, but they're completely unstructured, and they're very noisy. And so I'll define what we're interested in. So the multilateral relation in this context this is something that we're going to be interested in extracting, okay? we're gonna call it just a coherent thread of international events, okay? And they're characterized by certain countries that are doing most of the, most of the actions, certain countries that are receiving them, certain action types and, and time steps where these are happening. So this is an example of a, of a multilateral event, right? This is something that a political scientist actually put together. And we see that it's characterized by the fact that Iraq is doing most of the, most of the actions, 
the actions are kind of aggressive, right? And there are certain countries that are receiving them, like Kuwait and UAE and Egypt. And so if someone says they have a multilateral relation, the, the, these things characterize them. These things basically say, okay, who is doing what to whom and when in this thing? Okay, and so the goal here is we want to infer these automatically. Um, in other words, we want to tease apart the coherent threads of this, of, of the, you know, the unstructured, millions of unstructured dyadic events. Okay, and I want to show you right now uh, just a sample of the type of results that, that we get, and then I'll, I'll tell you about the actual model. So this is, a, this is a single component, what we call. It, sort of, it, it associates certain time steps with certain receivers, senders, receivers, and action types. And here, can you read this? Oh, so in the time steps, you see a huge spike, right, uh, around September 2001. Uh, the main senders are Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the United States. The main receiver is Afghanistan, right? And so this is clearly, this is, a, this is the Afghanistan war. It spikes immediately after 9-11. The United States invades Afghanistan, and it sort of it, it sort of draws down and then spikes back up as as the war as the war really did, right? And so this is the type of structure that that the model uh, infers from 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 the data. Um, and so okay, the model is based on naturally on on counting these events, okay? And so here's some counts. So these are two slices, um, two n by n slices. Uh, an entry in one of these is the number of times a certain country did a certain action type to another country in time. Okay, so the left one is the slice for all events that involved this action type, express intent to cooperate within the time step July 2002. The second one is with the action type threatened, same time step, okay? Um, and so one thing to notice, we've sorted the, action, the actors by their overall activity. Okay, so it's denser in the top right. The United States is up top. It's interacting rather densely with all the other countries. Um, and then it gets very sparse towards the bottom. We've only shown the top 40 by 40. There's about 230 countries. When you go down to the bottom right, it's basically all zeros, okay? And so different actions are, are rare. So in threatened, really, there's, there's these three dark spots. They're the main ones. This is, I mean, so for validity, this is United States to, um, to Iraq, uh, Palestine to Israel, and Iran to Israel, right? So these are the countries that are doing a lot of threatening to each other in July 2002. Okay, so these are the counts. Um, our model is plus on tensor factorization. I'm going to describe it uh, in terms of Poisson matrix factorization, which is a model that's, that's been widely used, and it's a simple generalization of that. Um, so matrix factorization, so you have an N by N, okay? Forget action type and time step for a second. We, you, you don't allow self-actions as we do in the paper, but that's a detail that, that doesn't really matter. Um, so in this case, a certain entry is the no total number of actions that one country took towards another in your whole data set. Okay, and I've constructed a toy example here. You clearly see there's, there are these two... Uh, Okay. Well, anyway, you see the two blocks, right? Good. <laughs> um, and so if you, if you want to have a model that infers these sort of submatrices, maybe they're not as well organized in your actual data, um, this, is, this is community detec detection, right? So um, a model for community detection, call this matrix Y. It's an N by N, right? We might say that this count is drawn from Poisson distribution, which is the sort of natural distribution for sparse counts. Okay, with a rate, with a positive rate, Poisson has a positive rate, that decomposes over K. And call K for now communities. Um, we're going to say the number of actions taken from I to J, you sum over communities, we have a factor that says how active country I is as a sender in this community, and then the other factor is how active is country J as a receiver. You sum over factors and you get the sort of rate, the total number of actions from I to J. Okay, and this is a, this is a dot product, right, so you can express this explicitly as a matrix factorization. We've done this spiel a couple times now, so, okay. This is a form of non-negative matrix factorization if you fit this model. Right, you get a matrix Y, and then you get back two factor matrices that share this latent uh, latent dimensionality K. Okay, and so what we're going to call a component is for a given index K that's going to index here into a, a column in the first one and a row in the second one, and this is going to um, this is going to give us a certain signature for this community. This is going to say, well, who are the top senders in this community, and who are the top receivers? And I've constructed a sort of very, I've constructed a very boring example where the top senders are the same top receivers, but they don't necessarily have to be. This is asymmetric, okay? And so the key point, the key takeaway is just a component, just the two vectors that are indexed by the same K in the factor matrices. Okay, so Poisson tensor factorization, 
Now you have account, it has four indices, sender, receiver, action type, and time. And uh, again, drawn from a Poisson is the assumption where we're going to sum over k. Now we're, we're going to call it a multilateral relation because it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit more uh, complex than a community. Again, the first two are the same similar factors. How active is country I as a sender? Country J as a receiver? And now you have a factor that says how important, how relevant is, is this action type in this multilateral relation? And when is this multilateral relation active in time? Okay? And this defines, this is defined for a single count, but this defines a tensor factorization implicitly. So if we fit this model, if we infer theta, um, this is another, again a form of non-negative tensor factorization. Uh, we have a four-way tensor Y, and we get back four factor matrices that are non-negative. Okay? And so now a component is going to be the set of factors, uh, so sorry, the set of factor vectors um, that are indexed by the same K in each of these, in each of these four matrices. Okay? So it's going to be a vector for senders, a vector for receivers, right, and so on. And so I'll show you another sample of the results. Now you know exactly what it is, right? Uh, up top, we plot all of the time step factors for a given K in chronological order. And then for the senders, receivers, and action types, we sort the vectors and show you the top 10. Okay, so in this case, um, you see three spikes, one around 1999, uh, 2001, 2008. The actors are Serbia, Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, right? So this is, uh, after a little bit of searching, this is the Yugoslav Wars, right? The first spike uh, is, is, uh, is, the, is the Kosovo War, followed by the, Macedonia, uh, the Macedonian insurgency, and then actually not shown in this Wikipedia article in 2008, Kosovo uh, declared independence. Okay, and so these different factor vectors give us this signature for this very complicated multilateral relation that's going on between these countries. Right? Um, so, so far, what I've said is that um, a tensor factorization on this data is very interesting. It gets some interesting results. Okay, um, so there's a, we have a sort of modest contribution to Poisson tensor factorization, which is a model that's been fit before, um, which is Bayesian inference. So this is the, the sort of the likelihood. This, this defines the, the, the basic model. And so we add priors. And these priors are specific gamma distributions that induce sparsity. Um, so they, they push their factors to zero, but they allow us for some big ones. Okay, when the shape parameter is less than one, and so when you're when you're when you're in the Bayesian case now, instead of taking point estimations of the factors, we're interested in this posterior distribution, the probability of the factors um, given the data, and it, as typically is the case, you can't compute this analytically. So uh, we move to a variational approach, and in variational inference, instead you define a, uh, a Q distribution, which is a sort of a convenient family of of distributions. Okay, and then you're going to optimize the parameters of that distribution to minimize the KL divergence of the exact posterior from that one, okay? And so how does this differ from just standard tensor factorization where you, you're, you're point estimating your factors? So say this is a factor matrix, okay? And I, I point estimate it just with a maximum likelihood method or, or whatever it is, I, I point estimate my factors, okay? So say that's, that's point estimating the factors, okay? This little hat is a, is a point estimate. So that really the only difference with variational inference uh, is that instead of taking these point estimates, we're learning these little distributions over each one independently, okay? And in our case, in our model, each of these distributions uh, is, is defined as a gamma distribution, where these are the variational parameters. These are the parameters that we're updating each round. So we're not directly updating the factors. We're updating the parameters of the distributions over these factors, okay? And after inference, if we want a point estimate of our factors, we can... Uh, we can go and take one. We can take, for example, the, the mean under this Q distribution to get, to get a point estimate, the arithmetic mean. We can take the geometric mean or the mode, okay? And so we have some details in the paper about that we make some recommendations for a different way of doing that. The geometric mean is probably better, okay? And so why do we do variational inference? Well, um, you know, it, it, it works a little bit better on sparse data. So uh, there's details in the paper on this experiment. Basically, if you're bold in the top right, you're better than if you're bold in the bottom left. <laughs> the, uh, the basic takeaway is just that uh, for very, very sparse data, the variational inference generalizes much better. Uh, and um, there's no sacrifice in efficiency over um, non-negative tensor factorization. So, um, so I, I put up some code on, on GitHub, and um, there's more sample results. So we, we, we pushed all the components. They're very fun to look through and interpret. Um, I want to show you uh, my favorite component. Uh, so this is um, on a run w of data from just 2011 to 2012. 
So there's two obvious key places where it happens in time, right? So this is Ecuador. The top actors are Ecuador, United Kingdom, United States, Sweden, Australia. And um, you know, if you go look at these and interpret them, they're very easy. You, you, search for, you search for the top actors and the date, and usually the first Wikipedia article just kind of explains it all. So this is Julian Assange. So Julian Assange, the founder of Wikipedia, he was, a, he was a, an Australian national. He was wanted by Sweden and the United States for some set of crimes. Okay, he was in the United Kingdom, and he was at the Ecuadorian embassy in the United Kingdom seeking asylum. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in June, this is when he asked for asylum, and then in September, this is when they granted asylum. And so this component gives you this nice signature of this very complicated multilateral relation that involved all these actors. Cool, thanks. I think that's the wrong poster number, but thanks. Uh, you have time for questions, yeah? So by dangerous, do you mean like more significant? Like that we should we should consider them? Yeah, uh, no, that's a that's a great question. So if you, if you look actually in all of these, uh, this consult event, in almost all the factors, I mean, in a lot of them, consult is the just the number one action because countries are just always consulting each other, right? It's sort of a, a cheap thing to do. Um, so I, I don't know how you. I, I think it's a it's 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 the right idea, right? I mean, you definitely there are certain events that you want to uh, promote. From an exploratory data analysis perspective, you would, want, you would want this to say, okay, this isn't just expressing how many counts there are of this kind, this is expressing, right, some importance. Oh, I see. I see, yeah, yeah, so, uh, I see, so some sort of like, um, some sort of Granger causality. Um, yeah, so, so this is a naive model where the time steps implicitly are being models of exchangeable, right? There's no temporal smoothness, there's no chaining. Uh, I mean, the temporal patterns pop out because they're so strong in the data. But, um, but so we, we fit a model recently where you, Im you impose this sort of a, a Markov chain, and that's where maybe you can get these dependencies, right? But uh, I, I, I think that's, yeah, I agree, that's super interesting. It's 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 you know it's it's very 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 sparse. So it's like uh, 0 05 percent non-zero. Um, and so uh, actually, so so the Poisson factorization is is great for this. So it scales with the just the number of non-zeros uh, in the tensor, um, because the Poisson is really I mean it, it really is the distribution for 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 sparse counts. Um, when you fit with variational, you also avoid this uh, this allocation step. So. Um, you 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 don't even scale with the the total number of events, which would be analogous to like tokens in topic modeling, right? Um, so we can fit to the entire GDEL uh, data set, which has like a quarter billion tokens or events, but so long as you count them in large enough time steps. So if you if you bin them monthly, so you have oh, so you have like uh, you know 300 time steps or something, you're fine. Um, but so a paper came out right after this. They they you can. You can do stochastic variational for this, and then you can really put this on whatever you want. You just stream over tons and tons of events. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, guys. Uh, we're done with.